Greetings FBLA PBL members. My name is Max Mitchell and I serve as the 2017-2018 FBLA National President. Today we are so excited to have our special guest Joseph Riley here who served as the FBLA National President from 2008 to 2009. He currently serves in the US Army and is a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Mr. Joseph Riley. Hi, Max, and uh, the rest of FBLA. Thank you for the opportunity to walk down memory lane and get to talk to you guys. Uh, I'm currently, as Max said, a captain in the United States Army, and I uh, actually just got back from a tour in Afghanistan. Um, so very excited to be able to talk with you today. FBLA has had a tremendous this impact. So I know it has all of you who are watching this video. Uh, and so there is that chain that links uh, all the way back to the 1960s up through the day. Business leaders uh, together who've, who've been in FBLA and benefited from it. Awesome. Well, uh, Joseph Riley, we're so excited to have you today. And my first question to you is kind of basic. It's how did you get involved in FBLA and uh, what inspired you to get involved? Uh, this is actually my freshman year in high school, and I was in keyboarding class. Uh, I was not doing so well in keyboarding, and my uh, uh, teacher told me that uh, since I failed the last test, if I would agree to enter this public speaking competition uh, and join FBLA, that she would give me an A on the test. Uh, so if you go to districts, I will give you an A on the next test. So I thought that would be a pretty easy A. And then she said, if you go to state, I'll give you an A on the next test or an A for the class. And so I went there uh, and then was fortunate enough and won at the state competition, got an A for the class. Uh, well, if you go to nationals and compete, then I'll give you an A for my next class. Uh, and then I went to nationals, saw all the national officers up on stage and what production FBLA can put on. And I decided that I wanted to do that. So I told her I wanted to run for a national office. She informed informed me that we'd never even had a district officer uh, and that there was no way we'd be able to run a national office. Uh, but uh, we gave it a shot, ran, and uh, was fortunate enough to get elected. So they helped me uh, you know, see the world beyond a little small town in East Tennessee where I grew up. Well, wow, that's such an interesting story. Um, my, my next question for you is, um, how has FBLA influenced your college and career decisions? Well, college, um, certainly college isn't for everyone, but I'm very glad I got to go. Um, so because of the, you know, Opulay getting to serve as national president, state president, some other things, I was fortunate enough to win a, a full ride scholarship to the University of Virginia. Uh, so there's no doubt that I not have, I, there's no way I would have been going to Virginia had it not been for FBLA. Uh, and then even to the present day, uh, right now, even though I'm serving in the military, I'm a business uh, that provides uh, real to provides homes uh, for uh, for military families who are living on posts. So we buy up old, rundown homes. We'll coordinate for contractors to come in. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's a bunch of boxes behind me. This is a house that we've renovated and are now renting to military families. So lessons, even though I didn't go a traditional track in business and decided to join the military. Nonetheless, uh, the kind of passion that I developed for business as a result of FBLA, you know, very much a part of what I do today. And uh, I think you just touched on, uh, you know, going to the Army. First of all, thank you so much for your service to our country. Uh, it means so much to all of us. And um, how, how did FBLA... As, as future business leaders, you're going to be future taxpayers. And I, I tell all the taxpayers paying me a salary to do what I've wanted to do since I was a five-year-old kid. So uh, the taxpayers put food on my table. So th thank you. <laughs> well, uh, again, we were so appreciative of everything you've done for our country. Um, my next question is, what kind of success stories have you heard from your peers, uh, from yourself, uh, about what FBLA has been able to do for them? I also write my wife, uh, who I met over at Oxford uh, when we were on the Rhodes program together. She created a consulting company called McKinsey and Company. Uh, and she, interestingly enough, uh, has two of her, her uh, colleagues uh, who were in FBLA. Uh, a great story. I'm a best man in a wedding for another Rhodes Scholar who's a Marine Corps officer. He was from North Dakota. 
And when we met in Oxford, he said, I think I remember, I don't know where it is. He said, did, were, did you, were you in FBLA? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I was too. Did you run for national president? And I, I said, yes. And so, uh, you know, the connection that he'd been a voting delegate from North Dakota the year I got elected. And then five years later, uh, we'd both won the same scholarship and we're going serving in the military. Now I'm uh, his uh, best man in his upcoming wedding. So everything from people who are serving in government uh, to people uh, in larger corporations like my wife, to people who are serving or starting their own companies and entrepreneurs, uh, FBLA has truly a wonderful impact it's had on my friends and peers. Wow, that's so interesting to hear. Um, my next question for you, and I think you touched on this with getting A's in your class, but what's, what are some other benefits that FBLA has given to you as a member? Uh, I mean, it's, you know, the network of people that you get to uh, you know, spend time with and learn from, uh, the, le the, the opportunities to compete uh, that it provides. I think competition is so important in the capitalist system in which we live. And so learning uh, the importance of hard work, how to compete, uh, how to network, all those things are crucial skills uh, for you, regardless of whether you want to go into a traditional business setting or in some other sort of leadership capacity. Oh, interesting. So how is um, serving as a national officer, how did that grow your leadership skills? And what would you tell people who are interested in running for national office? Uh, well, I'll start with advice for running for office, and that is to remember that uh, elections are always about people. Uh, so you can get all the fancy flyers you want, have all the candy to pass out, and the coolest board and the whatever else. But at the end of the day, it's about can you connect with the people as they walk through the booths? Do people believe that you care about them? Do you genuinely and are you able to make that personal connection? So it's great to work on all your materials beforehand. Uh, great to try to you know, memorize uh, but the biggest thing is just the personal one-on-one -on -one interactions that you're going to have uh, with the delegates and learning what they think the organization should do getting their ideas and sharing them with them yours um, in terms of and the other part of the question was what is an officer uh, how's the national officer growing your leader you know I I think it's tremendous right everything from traveling around the country and doing public speaking uh, there's a great story. You know, I grew up in a hick town in the middle of nowhere uh, as a hillbilly. And, uh, you know, I was by far probably the least tech savvy national president or national officer to ever serve, probably. Uh, and uh, so learning how to use uh, you know, digital that's how it's probably safe for me. That was a big thing to, to learn how to do. So, you know, I think it just it teaches you how to work small groups and the other national office. You how to, you know, try to reach out and inspire uh, larger groups of people uh, in the larger membership. It's so interesting. Um, now, uh, serving as a as a captain in the U.S. Army, what is uh, one of the mo more challenging aspects of your role, and how do you think FBLA has prepared you for that? Uh, well, I mean, at the end of the day, regardless of what organization you're leading, whether it's your teacher, your military officer, you're running the business, uh, you know, you have to motivate your uh, soldiers. I'm lucky enough that the, you know, the soldiers that I work with as a platoon leader, I just finished up being a platoon leader where I was in charge of 40 soldiers. Uh, and then I'll, I'm going on where I'll be in charge of about 140, 150. Um, and, uh, you know, that's... Uh, um, that is a, a unique to be able to lead uh, a bunch of, in this case, young men um, who have, you know, decided to uh, serve their country and put their unique challenge. Uh, and, and many times, some of them don't come from the best home backgrounds. Some of them come from rough areas. But the one thing that they're all committed to is to making this country a better place and to improving their own lives. And so that's a wonderful opportunity to get to go in and work with those guys serve alongside them, motivate them uh, uh, in terms of learning how to deal with people, work with people, motivate people. That's all stuff you learn in FBLA. Interesting. So uh, when you served as national president, what was probably one of the more surprising things? Uh, you mentioned that you're from a very southern town in Tennessee, uh, and of course you got to travel the nation. Uh, what surprised you about 
FBLA and visiting all these different states and, and seeing how they operated? Um, uh, let me think what surprised me most. Um, I don't know if I would say surprised, but just impressed by how, you know, you can go to all sorts of different parts of the country. They've got different, you know, cultures talk a little bit differently, you know, look differently, whatever else. But at the end of the day, all young Americans uh, who are aspiring to do great things with their lives, um, who share common you know, dreams and passions and ambitions. Uh, and so I think, I think that's as corny as it may sound. Uh, I think that that's the biggest thing is just learning uh, that all across the country, despite all the differences that there might, we share a common baseline. And that is a, a desire to improve our communities, to improve our families and to, you know, improve and serve the country that, that uh, opportunities that we enjoy. Awesome. And uh, I know you mentioned that you are a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means? Uh, so there's, um, you know, for high school students, right, what's the main thing you're focusing on? You're focusing on, on uh, um, you know, getting the scholarship uh, and not to be the Debbie Downer. But when you get to college, uh, you have a year or two to have fun. And then very soon you just go, so do I want to go? Uh, and get an advanced degree, a law degree, business degree, medical school, PhD, master's, whatever else it might be. I was in that you got to do the whole thing again in terms of applying for scholarships to get funding. Um, so the, the Rhodes Scholarship in particular has uh, been around since the early 1900s, uh, and it provides uh, students from across the world, from the UK, from the US, from Australia, New Zealand, Africa, China, you know, the UAE, Israel, you name India, Pakistan. Students from across the world have an opportunity to apply. And if you do, then you get to go to Oxford University uh, and do a uh, new graduate program there. So I was fortunate enough. I got nominated from the University of Virginia in my home state in Tennessee. Uh, the Rhodes Trust selects 32 scholars from the United States. Uh, I was lucky enough to be one of those 30. I went over to Oxford, uh, got my, did my master's and my PhD there in international relations. Uh, I focused mainly, I focused mainly on uh, economic relations in the post Cold War era. I'm actually right now finishing up a book uh, that's an adaptation of the dissertation. Um, so that's a little bit about the scholarship. Uh, the best thing I got out of, without a doubt, was meeting my wife. Uh, who's uh, who's just wonderful and supports me and everything that I do. Uh, just like many of you all will find your future spouses in uh, college or graduate school or work or wherever else. I know the dating yeah, uh, the big thing these days. I w talk to my friends who are on dating apps, and it's a whole new world for me. But uh, great opportunity out there to, to get additional educational funding. Well, what an interesting story that, that you're working on, on so much uh, uh, while you're in the Army. Um, speaking of that, what, in, what, what tips would you give to FBLA members who are, in, who are inspired to serve their country and, and serve in the same role that you do? Stay in good shape. Be a good person. Uh, don't get in trouble. Don't do drugs. If you do drugs, you can get in big trouble in the military. You know, play. you got to be... Um, Got to be in good shape, and uh, you know, the, teach all sorts of cool things. Jump out of airplane helicopters, go to cool countries. You know, uh, so there's just a tremendous amount of great opportunities that you can have, and all you need is an able body and a willing mind. So, all right, now I, I want to focus the final few questions on FBLA itself. Uh, serving as national president. Uh, what were some of the best moments that stood out to you, uh, whether it was being a member or whether it was being a national president? What were some of the most defining moments in your FBLA career? Oh, um, you know, on the local level, a big thing, my grandfather ran a, um, a rehabilitation center for men who are in alcohol addictions and who are leaving prison. And I was able to schedule every year our FBLA club to go and help do work there. and clean up the facility and work with the guy. One of my favorite memories at the local level, uh, at the state level, 
uh, I think it was definitely getting the hangout with the, the uh, <laughs> fellow state officers. And then at the national level, I think definitely my favorite memory was, um, you know, campaigning itself just because it gave me the opportunity uh, to get a lot of people uh, to work with the membership. And, um, you know, there's nothing like, uh, you know, having an effort the campaign was. So those are some of my favorites. All right. Well, I saved the hardest question for last, and that is how would you describe FBLA in one word? Opportunity. Wow. Well, and why that word specifically? Why opportunity? Um, because FBLA gave me all the opportunities that I enjoy today. Um, I think that's why you join. You know, you don't join just PowerPoint or Excel spreadsheets or public speaking or whatever else. All of those are only skills that are designed to help you achieve your ultimate uh, ambition. Uh, FBLA provides its members with opportunity, the opportunity to realize their full potential and to serve their community and, and build something that they're proud of. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Joseph Riley, a captain in the U.S. Army who served as the FBLA National President in 2008, uh, 2008 to 2009. Thank you so much for sharing your story, and, and I'm sure that uh, all of the members who are watching this will benefit from this. So thank you again, and, and again, thank you for your service to our country. Thank you very much, Max.